All right. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Kirsten, and I am the Public Engagement Coordinator at Georgia Strait Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us at the fourth webinar from our Salish Sea BioBlitz, where we are going to be exploring the intertidal zone with our friend Yuko from Seaclaria Ocean Education. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we, I'm gathered, are coming to you broadcasting from the unceded territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people. And um, the whole point of this BioBlitz is for us to connect to our environments and learn a little bit more about this place where we are so privileged to live. So knowing what territory you're on and honoring that uh, history is a really important part of it. So I encourage everyone to put, um, what territory you're joining from if you know into the chat box so we can get an idea of where everyone is signing in from if you don't know what territory you're on right now the website nativeland.ca is a really good resource uh, i'd also like to introduce my friend chelsea who is my co-planner of this bio blitz hi everyone thanks for tuning in uh, my name's chelsea i'm an ocean bridge young leader in the 2020 cohort Kirsten is also an Ocean Bridge alumni from the 2019 cohort. For those of you who do not know what Ocean Bridge is, it's a national youth program from OceanWise that brings together Canadian youth between the ages of 18 and 30 to organize and participate in ocean and waterway service projects. The Great Sailor Sea BioBliss is one of my Ocean Bridge community service projects. So what is a BioBliss? It's like a biological inventory, but instead of scientists collecting data, anyone can. So everyone can, as long as you have the app iNaturalist. It's a form of citizen science aimed to collect as much information about as many different species in a certain area and a specific time frame. The Great Sailor Sea BioBlitz is taking place all across, all across the Sailor Sea bioregion. So utilizing the app iNaturalist, Anyone in the Salish Sea bioregion can participate and you can maintain that COVID-19 physical distancing measures while still going out with your bubble, taking observations, and just collecting all this awesome data. So yeah, to join it, just download the iNaturalist app, look up the project, the Great Salish Sea BioBlitz, and hit join. And there you are wearing it. Uh, to, today, like as of this moment, we've had 1,627 observations with 575 different species. So we're doing pretty good. Uh, yeah, get out there whenever you can and uh, take some observations. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and hopefully after this next webinar, you guys, everyone here will be very up to snuff on all of the intertidal animals that you will see, which are some of the most exciting things to kind of find as part of this bio blitz because uh, it's very accessible and all you have to do is head down to the shoreline at low tide and you will likely see some of the animals that Yuko is going to be describing and showing us today. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to welcome Yuko here and we're not just welcoming Yuko but also all of the animals in the Sequaria Aquarium so you can see them up close and personal. For those of you who don't know Yuko, Yuko Lin is an enthusiastic science communicator um, with a BSc in marine biology and a minor in environmental studies, pursuing a career in education. Sequaria Ocean Education it delivers engaging, hands-on educational experiences to inspire the next generation of environmental stewards. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to welcome Yuko and get started. So I'm going to now turn the reins, stop sharing my screen and turn the reins over to Yuko. Hello. All right, let's now set this up. Hello, I'm Yuko, and today I am also joined by Royal Fisheries Trust Executive Director here, who's grabbing some lunch. Yogi, you want to pop into the camera? Hello. This is Yogi Karelsfeld. He is Royal Fisheries Trust Executive Director, and he's also the founder of Aquaria Ocean Education. And today we'll be exploring the intertidal zone. So before we start, I want to talk a little bit about what the intertidal zone is. So inter, if we break the word down, inter means uh, between and tidal, the tides. So the intertidal zone is that part of land that uh, connects land and ocean. 
And this zone is very, very special because it is covered by water twice a day, but also exposed to air twice a day. So this really introduces a whole brand new set of challenges for life uh, living in the intertidal zone. And we're gonna go through some of the animals that you will be able to find if you're ever out exploring a rocky beach like Clover Point. Um, yeah, let's get started. Let's start with these guys here. And does anyone know what these animals are that I have on this plexiglass? <laughs> or as Yogi says, on our COVID shield. <laughs> They're very well protected. These are limpids. Yeah, I see a couple people in the audience uh, answer correctly. So I have a white cap limpet here, and this is a shield limpet. Correct me if I'm wrong. Limpets are quite difficult to identify. I'm still learning how to identify all the different species. And limpets are um, mollusks. They're part of the same family as snails. They are marine snails. And because of the plexiglass, you can see this is their foot right here. Ah, I see someone call this the belly. And when I was younger, I did think this was the belly, but this actually is their foot. And if you look very closely off to the side, beside the foot, you can actually see the gills. And this right here, does anyone know what this part of can also see it on this guy right here. This bit right here, that's their mouth. And limpets, uh, like land snails, they have something called a radula, which is what I describe as a conveyor belt of teeth. They are herbivores and they use their little conveyor belt of teeth to scrape algae off of them. Which is why oftentimes when you go out exploring the beach, you can find them anchored down on rocks and <laughs> limpets are very cute, yes. And one way that they really suction down um, to prevent them from being picked up by predators or washed away by waves, uh, they use their mantle to suction down onto the substrate. Yeah. Do you have anything else to add about the limpets? Any cool facts I'm missing out? I mean, you talked about the, the um, skills. So, uh, the water actually goes in one side here and comes out the other and the gills are in behind it. I'm just going to jump in. It's a little bit hard to hear Yogi, so maybe if you could speak into the microphone a bit closer. Yeah, one sec. I'm just having a little bit of technical difficulties. There you go. Oh. Yeah, well, it's just, it's just Oops, sorry. There you go. Okay. So I'll give you the oh, front here. Mm -hmm. yeah. we'll, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> I love limpets. We'll put a video out just on limpets. And then the next animal I want to showcase is this guy right here. So this is a burrowing sea cucumber. And I can tell it's pretty relaxed right now because the frills right here, this, those are its feeding tentacles. So when they're feeling a bit stressed or if they're out of the water, they start curling up into a ball and they kind of look like a tiny little football. You can find this, this little guy uh, during low tide. They're usually at, at the lowest point of the tide, so just right before um, the, the water line. And you can find them hiding under rocks. Uh, rock crevices is where you'll find them. Now I do want to point out, I, I know everyone loves going out to the beach and exploring and kind of picking up the shore crabs because they're just so cute. But for the cucumber, it is better if we observe with our eyes rather than touch them because when they're stressed, they also start bleeding. So they do have hemoglobin in their blood. So they will essentially just kind of start bleeding blood out, which, is, which can be very terrifying. It might be a bit traumatic if you have children with you. And you can also see rows of tube feet here. 
and the sea cucumber are part of the same family group as the sea stuff. Spinoderms or spiny skin. Okay, is our star eating? So I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna use my other camera. So we had a question in the... Switch over to my other camera so I can better showcase this animal that I have. While you're switching over, we had a question about um, how can you tell the difference between furrowing sea cucumber and orange sea cucumber? Oh, I think orange, sea, they're the same, they're the same um, species. So orange cucumber and burrowing sea cucumber are the same species. They just have, I think, about three or four different common names. Hmm. Actually, before we move on then, let's grab the other species. The other common species of sea cucumber you may find if it's a very, very low tide is this guy here. This is the California sea cucumber. I wasn't going to bring him out because for this California sea cucumber, they're a lot harder to find when you're just out exploring uh, the beach. But I'll let you compare the two. Now the burrowing sea cucumber, so the orange sea cucumber here has five rows of tube feet that's all around its body. While the California sea cucumber has its tube feet on the bottom of its body. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put him here. Hey, Hugo, we had a yeah. question. Are sea cucumbers seasonal or year-round animals? I believe they're year-round. They can live yeah. for a long time. So they live, uh, we don't know for sure, but they might be living around 25 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unless you get predated on, sea cucumbers can live to about 25 years. Is what has been reported. Hmm. And I also forgot I brought along. I'm gonna try switching my camera. See if this works. There you go. So this guy right here is also a sea cucumber. This is an armored sea cucumber, um, also known as petal sea cucumber. And you can see this little bit right here. That's where it's. Um, respiratory tree comes out of. So unlike the uh, orange or burrowing sea cucumber, yeah, so these tentacles are feeding tentacles here. Oh, I'm playing with respiratory. Oh, my apologies, I'm going to correct myself. This is where the feeding tentacles come out. And Right over here, I have the iconic purple sea star. And you can tell sea cucumbers and sea stars are part of the same family group because they also have two feet. So this one right here is the purple, purple ochre star. And this guy right here is actually a leather star. And the leather star was recently feeding on this muscle. I believe that's its, one of its two stomachs poking out right there. I'm a little worried this ochre star is going to start gobbling up this leather star here. So I will be removing him very shortly. Hey Yuko, is it um, normal for sea stars to eat other sea stars? And we also had a question in the chat about um, if any of these animals you're showing us are edible for people, I guess. Hmm. Sea stars, I'm not, I've, I've heard people eat it, but I'm not sure if, if they're edible on our coast. You know, Yogi? Um, starfish are not uh, seagull eaters. Um, but uh, the sea cucumbers are eaten. So the California around here is one that uh, fits commercially. Um, and on a global scale, sea cucumbers are um, in many cases an endangered fish from overfishing. So cucumbers are the sea cucumbers are definitely edible, most of them. Um, but not the starfish. So just to repeat, 
what Yogi said in case my microphone didn't pick it up. Yogi's a popular man today. Um, so sea cucumbers. So the California sea cucumber has been eaten on our coast and there's a fisheries for it. But generally, sea stars are not eaten by people. Uh, seagulls like to gobble them up. I saw a terrifying photo of a seagull just swallowing a purple sea star. And some starfish species uh, eat other, uh, other starfish. They specialize on it. Mm -hmm. But these two don't generally. The leather star will eat a lot some of the smaller starfish. The purple starfish generally will eat other starfish. Mm -hmm. So there's a sun star and there's a solar star. They specialize in eating other starfish and sea cucumbers as well as the ocean. Yeah, and just uh, as we were talking about sea stars, our California is a little active, so I wanted to show spotlight spotlight him as well. He's kind of exploring, looking for food. Does anyone know how sea cucumbers find their food? So they don't have eyes. So if we're a little bit patient, I'm, I think he might put out his feet, which is a very exciting, at least for me, a very exciting sight to see. That right here is kind of feeling around for food. They have sticky feeding tentacles and they that little bit right there is him attempting to feed off of this gumboot chitin underneath him. So as I was saying, they mosey along uh, in the water and they feel around for their feeding tentacles. And after they stick onto small particles of food, they actually bring their tentacles back into their mouth. And it's kind of like us licking off our Cheeto fingers after a bag of up their bag of Cheetos. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we have another orange or burrowing sea cucumber sticking its tentacles up. So when you're exploring the beach, this is most likely what you will find if you do uh, ever see a uh, burrowing sea cucumber. So this one's still proceeding. Mm -hmm. and that's the tritus feeder. So they eat. Uh, no mud or poop, dead things. And he, this guy will just passively let the water bring food to him rather than looking for it. Okay, I'm gonna switch back to my main camera here, Kristen. Hi, Yuko. Um, we had a question from Catherine. Yes. She asked, what are some of the main ID features between the leather and purple stars? Or if it's just color, if there's something, an easier way to tell them apart? Yeah, let me actually bring the leather star out. Oh, I might need your help, Yogi. He's on there pretty tight. I have a very hard time removing ochre stars off of our tanks here. So. Yeah, ochre stars are higher intertidal, so they stick on them really well. Mm -hmm. So leather stars, if you can tell on my camera, they're a lot smoother. Their coloration also reminds me of a pepperoni pizza. And allegedly, I haven't been able to smell it. Allegedly, they smell like garlic as well. So if you, you know, go on the beach, if you ever see a leather star, give it a big old whiff. You might look a little silly, but I want to know if it actually does smell like garlic to some people. Particularly <laughs> in the armpit. <laughs> and I'm going to just pick this guy out for you to see. E. This is the iconic purple ochre star. They're way, oh, they're, this one is way bigger than this one here, but they are more textured. So if you touch them, they're bumpy and they feel harder. This, the leather star, holding it in my hands feels like wet leather, which is where their common name comes from. There we go. And how big can purple stars get? How big do these guys get? I think, yeah, this is about, I'll put up my hand so you can have a comparison. It 
in, in the Sailor Sea, yeah. And you can see right in the middle there is its mouth, all the two feet. And as Yogi was saying, was mentioning earlier, the sea star wasting disease was mostly affecting this species here, this purple species, which also comes in uh, an orangey color. Well, the leather star was actually doing quite well despite the despite the disease being uh, prevalent in this in the community of this species. And have we figured out what was the cause of the sea star wasting disease? Or is this still it just a gun? Not, well, it seems to have been a virus or is a virus that uh, is in the environment anyway. So it somehow became um, virulent or started mm -hmm. killing things off. It's interesting, the purple star, as I said, has gone through very rapid evolution. So the populations now are you now have the resistant gene and then in most cases. Uh, you know, they have rebounded very quickly, much faster than they would have expected. Mm -hmm. The um, body of the sunflower star is the one that um, was first seen as being really uh, affected by this disease, or maybe noticed, mm -hmm. and it hasn't rebounded that quickly. So, yeah, I'm just going to pop this all back on the table there. It was a little precarious. Okay, hey, hey Yuko, it's still very hard for us to hear what Yogi's saying, I think, because he's a little bit off to the side. So can you mm -hmm. summarize what he just said? Of course. So the sea star wasting disease was most affecting the uh, ochre star, so the purple and orange sea stars that we usually find on the beach, whereas the leather star was brewing not terribly. And we don't really know what exacerbated the disease. Uh, so the sea star wasting disease is a virus, it's viral, and it has been in the community, in the ecosystem already, but something happened to make, uh, to make it more prevalent. So a lot, for example, the sunflower stars got affected, their population dropped pretty dramatically. And Yogi was saying the, that the ochre stars are rebounding quite quickly. It seems like they have more or less adapted to the virus. Yeah. It's kind of like COVID. So hopefully we are as resilient as the purple ochre stars as a species. Uh, we had a couple questions in the chat. I'll just, I'll, get, I'll give you two. So one was about the leather stars and how big they can get, if they can get bigger than that one there that you had, and also what the circular white dots on the sea stars are. Hmm, very good question. So the leather stars, I've seen, I've seen really, really large ones. Um, you can, I think the aquarium up in Sydney has quite a few large leather stars. Um, they, to, from what I observed, they do get bigger and also thicker than the purple. The purple. It's about, about two of my hands put together. Our system can't support such a big star, unfortunately. And the dot, let me, let me actually grab the sea star again so we can see. So this orange dot right here is a madrigal porite. Correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Yogi. This is where the sea star draws water into its body uh, in order for it to move. Kind of like a water, a, a steam engine, but with water. They need to draw water into their body in order for them to move, to move their tube feet. See how right now they're kind of, they're kind of still. They're, they're kind of limpy, the ones in the middle here. That's because I've taken him out of the water and he doesn't have anything to draw in and move around. So this, uh, these little white dots here are part of their internal skeleton. It's called ossicle, so it's what gives them their structures. And another animal, in the same family is the sea urchins, and they also have that uh, calcareous internal skeleton. 
two of the most iconic species, I would say, of the intertidal zone here. The other animal I was super excited to talk about, because you can find them literally on any beach in Victoria, are the aggregating anemones. This little square right here. What's so special about them is these anemones will clone, they reproduce by cloning. So sometimes on the beach you can find two of these anemones, but there's a fleshy bit connecting them and that's and that's because one of the anemone was pulling basically pulling itself apart to create another individual and you get large colonies of these anemones on the beach and you can find them either buried in the sand or attached to rocks i know up in sydney um by the rock or talisa talisa boat ramp the beach there, there's quite a few of these anemones. And you can also find a lot of them in the Sydney Marine Harbor as well. Yeah. What else do you have to add about the sea anemones? Um, mm, right, I forgot about that. So these sea anemones, they have a symbiotic algae in them. That means they do photosynthesize, which is insane because this is an animal and it can photosynthesize. It's very much like the coral. Mm -hmm. They're like a squishier, squishier coral. So I thought I saw a question about feeding habits pop up on my screen. Is that correct, Kirsten? Yeah. Are anemones filter feeders or do they eat small animals? They will eat small animals. So when they're in the water and their tentacles are out, they actually have stinging cells in those tentacles. So if a small a shrimp swims by, they will, if the shrimp brushes past the tentacles, it gets stung and it gets kind of shocked. And that's when the anemone can stick to it and draw it into its mouth, which is in the middle of its squishy body, right there. I have a question for you as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was, I was wondering, um, what was that anemone's name? This is the aggregating anemone. Aggregating. And another question, do they all um, have that symbiotic relationship with the algae or is it just the aggregating? Not every species have it. I know for sure the aggregating. Do you remember the common name? So the scientific name? Mm. So the, if you ever go diving off of our coast, those giant green anemones, they also have that uh, algal symbiosis. On the west coast, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the tide pools is what Yogi was saying. Thank you. I also, fo sorry, follow up. I'm just so interested in this. Do they all clone as well? Or is, is it that a specific anemones do the cloning? Some anemones will reproduce by broadcast spawning. Um, the mo How about plumos? Do plumos clone or do they, they sex their sexual reproduction, right? Many are capable of it. And related one species mm -hmm. and squirrels and other species that um probably. So it depends on the species. Yeah. Did everyone catch that? Or should I summarize in my booming voice? A, a summer a quick summary would be good. Yeah, no problem. So uh, other species, other subtitle species, so species that live deeper in the water column, do clone, but the aggregating anemone is the best example. They do it the best, I guess you could say. Um, and other species related to the aggregating anemones, like the giant green ones that you find in tide pools and when you dive, they also clone, and not very often. Yeah, so anemones, there's so many species of them out there, and each species, they have different reproduction strategies. Um, the ones that we see the most, because they're more accessible, are the aggregating ones. Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. So there was, I read this article a while back, uh, 
article and it was all about chemical defense in aggregating anemones. And the title was wonderful. It was Behind Anemone Lines. And that's because when you have two different clones, so they create a colony of clones, if you have two different ones, there's often a strip of barren land down the middle separating the two uh, different colonies. Because the ones at the edge will actually fight fight each other. They have warrior anemones. And this is um, a competition for space. Because you have more space, you have a better chance of survival. So you get sort of war no man's land between two different colonies as well. See if you guys can find it on the beach. I think I've seen it a couple times and it's really, really bizarre. Because you see like so many enemies, empty strip of land in the middle. Hmm. So the other guy, I want to see if I can let him off of here. The other common animal you will find in the intertidosome, especially if you flip up algae or look under rocks, are these guys right here. These prehistoric looking animals, or animal is, are chitin. So chitons, they have eight shells on the back here that, that helps protect uh, their soft body. And let me see if I can. Mm -hmm. I will try to gum boot again. I've been trying to like get him off, but he's stuck on pretty, pretty tight. So like the limpets, they also have a foot in the middle and their gills are located next to their foot and they have a mouth with a radula or a conveyor belt of teeth that scrapes algae off of rocks. And they're very cool. They remind me of little bugs because if they ever come detached from the rocks, they start curling up, which is what this one is slowly doing in my, in my hand. This one right here is the mossy chitin. Oh, no, my apologies, this is the lined chitin. And it's slowly starting to curl up. The other species that are, that's very common on our coast is the black katie chitin or the leather chitin. And occasionally, if the tide is right, you wanna try removing them. <laughs> Yogi is way more efficient than me in removing animals stuck to our basins and our tanks. Sometimes they just they are very stubborn and they don't want to let go. While well, Yogi is digging that out, um, do all different chitons, do they all eat the same things? Do they all eat the same things? They're all her herbivores. Um, but I think like any animals, they are also opportunity eaters. So if they come across say a dead crab or something, they will feed on that. So it's really hard to put them into a certain box about what they eat. It, yeah, actually it, um, they all scrape stuff off of rocks. I think we'll have to get your other camera on that guy. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, we he's don't a, really want to damage him. You know, he's a stubborn. But uh, some are more strictly herbivores than others. Um, most will, like the mossy chitin, it eats in crusting um, moss animals and bryozoans uh, quite aggressively. Um, the cryptochitin, we don't really know what he eats. He sits around and doesn't eat anything for a long time. So they, to some extent, they also absorb um, organic molecules out of the water. Uh, there is a carnivorous has a little hood that he holds up and he and she and uh, when things crawl under it he snaps it down and gobbles up that thing. Awesome. Thanks, Yogi. So yeah. one of my favorite fun fact about the chitin here, we call him a gumboot chitin, but he's also known as the wandering meatloaf. It's always a hit kids and when you're out exploring the beach these guys blend in they look just like any other rock on the beach so you really have to look for them I've almost stepped on so many of them just when I'm just out tide pooling and I think the best place to see uh, this chitin will be at Ogden Point on the breakwater when it's low tide there's tons and tons of chitons there so a great place to find this species 
And I believe this species is also the biggest chitin species on our coast. That's amazing. We had a question, another question about them eating. So Sarah asked, how do chitons absorb food? And also that is so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. How do they absorb it? I'm not actually very familiar with that aspect. Yogi, would you like to speak more to how they absorb uh, molecules? Is it through their skin or is it on their uh, foot? Yeah, it's mostly through the, you know, the, the skin or their gills. Um, some animals do it much better than others. So sea anemones are, are quite good at making use of the, what they call the dissolved organic uh, material, DOM. And um, chitons less so, but it would be, in their case, it would be primarily through the gills, the same time as their you know, way that they're absorbing the oxygen. So just for a refresh, their gills are located on either side of their central foot here. He's quite a small little guy, so it's a little bit hard to see. Awesome. How much time do we have left, girls? Uh, uh, <laughs> the honest, we can go. We can go for up to twenty more minutes if you want. But I also only um, if you, what was. Sorry, uh, I think we were originally planning to go for 30 to 40 minutes. So mm -hmm. if you're running out of things to talk about, it has been about that much time. So um, I think I, I still have a couple more animals I can showcase. <laughs> I would like to see if that's, that's what the audience wants. <laughs> oh, you know what? I did forget to mention that. So just so everyone can see, so this kind of is a little bit special because its shells are underneath its skin, unlike the black heated chitin or the lime chitin here. And this is what the shells look like. They look like little butterflies. And there's eight of them lined up together. So when they are knocked off of the rock or off of whatever they're clinging onto, they curl up and these are like, are like their armors that protects them from being pecked at or picked at crabs. I had a Grayson um, story is that uh, this is where people can see. Oh, I didn't know that. Yogi just mentioned that in the Haida creation story, um, we people came from the Gumboot Chitin, which I did not know. Thank you for sharing, Yogi. So, so I'm gonna switch back to me to to me other camera to my other camera because I want to bring out one of my favorites. One of, your other one of my other favorites, Yogi says. Yeah, I have a lot of favorite animals that live in the intertidal zone. This guy is not an intertidal species, but I wanted to showcase him. I got a lot of comments, especially from kids, that barnacles are very boring, and I think that's absolutely wrong. Barnacles are not boring, and they're very important for our ecosystem. So these barnacles that you'll commonly find on the beach um, and you know what I get it they don't look like much and they're pretty boring when they're out of the water because they close up but I wanted to show you this is the scoot or the operculum of the barnacle and it actually opens up when they're feeding when this one lives deeper in the water so when he's deep in the water and there's food he sticks out an uh, eyelash looking part of their body and they start swiping at the water kind of like they're fist pumping at the club or at a party and that part is actually part of their foot so barnacles eat with their foot and they also live their entire lives upside down so when uh, barnacles are first born they're a free swimming larvae so they're mobile they swim around looking for the perfect place to call their forever home and once they find that spot, they actually glue or cement their heads onto the rock or whatever substrate they're on, and they will start building their shell. And they just live, live like this for the rest of their life. And they also molt, which is, I thought was really cool. And what I love, uh, 
talking about uh, regarding the barnacle is they're also related to crabs and spiders. They're uh, arthropods, so they're in the same family group as spiders. They look nothing alike. And they're awesome at filtering water because they, when they uh, use their feet to, or their foot to feed, they take away all of the little bits of organic matter in the water and they basically filter it like mussels or oysters do. Oh, I didn't even see coral. that. And Yogi just pointed out, I thought it was a tunicate, but this is a solitary coral that's living on the barnacle. Barnacles also make a great habitat for other animals, so that not only are they cleaning our water, but they're also providing more habitat for other animals to live in or around. I think we have... And if you see all the holes, these are all from the boring sponge. Not boring, like you're bored, but boring like you're making a hole. Isn't that cool? I don't know. Are we, okay. are there kids here? So can, can I say and not say for work fact about them? Or is that not okay? <laughs> Well, I'm I'm very intrigued by this. <laughs> okay, because I wasn't sure like what audience we're with, but barnacles have the world's largest penis. If we're looking at like body ratio and genitalia size comparison, but barnacles have one of the largest penises in the animal kingdom. Wow, well, I think that you are doing a really good job of making barnacle fans out of all of us today. <laughs> right. I, what I really want to do is. A not safe for work uh, marine guidebook, but maybe that's for the future. We're not, we won't get into that today. Yeah, if you can catch him. Does the, um, sorry, question about the boring sponge. Is it trying to eat the barnacle? Is that what the holes are from? No, it's, uh, it's not eating, I mean, it's the sponge filter. Sponge filter feeds, mm -hmm. but it finds its home in the calcium, uh, dissolves of the calcium. So the boring sponge, they are filter feeders. So sponges are, they're generally all filter feeders. What it's trying to do is, it, by settling on um, the barnacle, they kind of use up the calcium that's in the barnacle shell, leaving little holes because they're just dissolving the calcium and using it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot about him. I should have bought him up. This is. If, are you sure this is the right one? I think this is the empty shell. No, no. So he's very shy, but this is Bobby, our hermit crab. Uh, he is very in the shell, so I don't. I might let him relax a little bit before I showcase him. But hermit crabs, most us not, I think, know this, but hermit crabs are not born with their shells. So as they get bigger, they actually have to go and find new real estate, new uh, homes. And they usually make homes out of chitin, or not chitin, snail shells, like this one right here. I promise you, there is one here. He's just very, very shy right now. Sometimes I look at our hermit crabs and I wish that our rental real estate was as good as their shell real estate. Yeah. And another really exciting intertidal animal that you might be able to find on a really, really low tide are, is the decorator crabs. Um, oh, this might be a too small container. So this is a decorator crab. Let me just wrangle her. She is not happy with me holding her. The decorator crab, they get their common name from the fact that they decorate themselves with algae. So they're very, very good uh, at camouflaging. And their little pinchers, you can see she's trying to pinch me right now, are really great at snipping off algae. And what they do is they'll spit on the algae and they'll basically put it on their carapace or their shell. And they have little hooks 
on their shells that they hook the algae on. And this way they can camouflage perfectly into whatever environment they're in. They're also a little bit, I like to call them little divas, because when they're ever in a new environment, say they were predominantly red environment to a green algae environment, they will shed all of their um, seaweed that they have attached and put on new ones. This way they blend in with wh wherever they are at. And some species also will take sea anemones and put them either on their the nose piece of their head or on their backs and the sea anemones will help protect them from predators. They're very, very cool animals. We get a, I get a lot of kids kind of being scared of them because they look like spiders, but they're honestly so gentle, so docile, and very, very graceful as well. I'm gonna put her back so she doesn't crawl out into the desk. So her little pinchers don't hurt when they pinch you? No, not really. It, it kind of feels like a, like a really sharp pencil poking my skin. Um, but it doesn't hurt when they pinch me. Yeah. So Yogi was saying we have to be really careful we don't drop them because their legs are so fine and thin that they do get injured quite easily. So we we put them into all basically all of that we install into the schools and they're great animals for observation. So if you ever see them, don't pick them up on the beach. Just observe them if you can find them. They're really good at hiding. And I think this might be the last animal that I have prepared. We can talk about seaweeds if you guys are interested. But this is the hermit crab. This is Bobby. We got a couple different species of hermit crabs on our coast. Um, we have, I think, I believe this is the bearing, B-E-R-I-N-G, bearing hermit crab. Yeah. And hermit crabs, they don't, again, they don't, they're not born with their shells. Their lower half of their body, so their abdomen, is really soft and they curl into the so Evolution has uh, made them able to fit perfectly in snail shells. Their body just curls into the shell, which is super cool. And they are primarily detritivores, so they'll, and scavengers, so they'll pick at anything um that they can find if it's something dead or something slow moving they'll start picking at it and from what i observe they are quite quite the bully for other other animals and they will tear up all of the hard all of the algae that we landscape into the tanks they're quite amusing they're good at learning oh i didn't know that you just mentioned that they're very good at learning can you elaborate when they switch shells and they grow quickly to take advantage of that. So they've got a different control mechanism over growth. So then through evolution, they've popped back out of the shells, but they've retained this ability to grow really large. So that's where the king crabs have become really quite large animals, large crabs. So it's kind of an interesting pathway. Yeah. I'm learning just as much as everyone else is learning. It's really exciting. <laughs> and I lied. Yogi wants me to talk about our oysters, which he was hidden, so I forgot about him. This, I think I'm gonna go over him really quickly. This is an Olympia oyster. This is our only native species of oyster, and they're quite different than the more common oyster that we have on our beaches. So this here is a Pacific oyster. This is an Olympia oyster. This is introduced and invasive. This is our native species. Um, so during the gold rush era, 
so many people flooded in into Victoria for the uh, for panning gold. And this was what was served to them. There were so many oyster saloons on the island, and this was the main oyster that were eaten. And eventually they were over harvested, so the population has dwindled quite a bit. This is an endangered species now. And um, the dwindling Olympia oyster fisheries, the Jap this is the Pacific oyster. It, we brought in the Pacific oyster from Japan and we started a Pacific oyster fisheries here. This is what you'll find mostly when you go to the beach. I think you can only really see Olympia oysters in the wild at the gorge, is where I've seen it the most. Um, Fisherman's Wharf, not yet. We're it's at, just a few spots. Um, yeah, we, are at, we actually put in an oyster cage um, under the docks at Fisherman's Wharf with a bunch of these little guys to hopefully facilitate them um, settling there and bringing the Olympia oyster population back up. We'll let you know how that goes. We're still monitoring them. We have been monitoring the Olympia oysters for the last five or six years, so it's very exciting. These guys have genders every, um, every year, so they start off their life as males, so they will produce sperm, and then the next year they will actually switch to females and produce eggs, and they alternate, alternate sexes every year uh, during reproduction season. Another fun fact about them. Mm. And unlike uh, other oysters, they will brood their babies. Brooding means that they will keep their eggs in their shells and protect them rather than just kind of letting them go out in the wild and finding their own way before, they, before they're hatched. And they'll keep them safe until they're large enough to be released. That's mm -hmm. We I have a question about tunicates. Are they intertidal also or? Um, do they live in the other levels of the ocean? Uh, tunicates can be intertidal. I've seen tunicates um, in the lower intertidal. Um, I don't know too much about them. I know I'm allergic to them. Well, it um, depends on the species. So you certainly find some of the colonial species intertidal. Sometimes it's hard to tell them apart from sponges. So they are kind of an encrusting um, thing it tends to be much smoother than a sponge. So there's some white colonial tunicates. Um, there's also a uh, one that have hard, harder shell. I mean, outer tunics they call them, of course, but um, that are intertidal. Um, so it depends a bit on the species, but you'll certainly find some of the the wrinkly, hard hard coated ones intertidally under the rocks. If you want to find tunicates, I would suggest going to the docks because tunicates are a fouling organism, so they will grow on dock pilings or on other animals. Um, we have a couple different species on the coast. We have colonial ones as well as solitary ones, um, but they're, I find them a little bit difficult to identify when I'm out in the field unless I'm with like a at this for the last 30 years like Yogi has. But I know a couple fun facts about them. The colonial ones can communicate with each other. We don't really know how they communicate with each other, but they have little um, kind of little string looking connecting each individual one, individual one in the colony and they communicate via that connection, which reminds me of like a tin can with a string. Yeah, I think that's all I have prepped for today. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> do, you guys, do you guys want a little quick talk on algae? We did collect some algae that I forgot about. Sure, a quick, we have, so we have five more minutes left. Um, and I also, we got a question in the Q&A about saying, can you guys do a YouTube video on about the research on sea star wasting disease? That would be interesting. And I would love if you could take some time to talk a little bit more about um, how people can learn more from Super Art Ocean Education and your work um, and what you do, like just a little bit more about what you have and how they can connect after this webinar ends in a few minutes. Yeah, so I would love to talk about that. We actually, Sequaria just launched a new YouTube channel. Um, we were trying to pump out videos for people to learn. 
explore the beach by themselves. Uh, you can find us on YouTube at Seaquaria Ocean Education. We also do little fun facts on our Instagram page. You can look for us at Seaquaria underscore ocean underscore education. Um, what else? On our website, so seaquaria.org, I will send Kristen all of this information and she can also send that out so you guys don't have to frantically write it down. On our website, we have an educator resources page with um, formal lesson plans, which you can use at home or if you're an educator uh, working in a classroom, there are really great printouts for your classroom as well. We're, we also pumped out um, some info sheets, which is a two page frequently asked questions about certain animals or certain algae. Uh, we're also, we also take requests. So if you want us to create a fact sheet about sea cucumbers, that and put it on our website for you to download. We also have a bunch of short, fun activities and experiments on our website as well. Yeah, and pre-COVID, we what we do is we set up these aquariums, these 75 gallon aquariums inside different schools in the Greater Victoria District. And these are year-round educational tools. It's a snapshot of the Sailor Sea. So all of the animals that I feature today, you can find them in one of these tanks inside a school. Um, and that is what one of our main activities is going in and doing programs related to the aquarium, related to the Salish Sea ecosystem. Uh, we also take students out to the beach and we do a beach program. We've done, yeah, you find on our website. So if you're an educator and you want to book us for a program, we're, we love, we love taking uh, kids out to the beach and doing um, quadrats or even a beach sign. So just contact us. I see, can people volunteer with you? Yes, we love volunteers and we, uh, a lot of our activities, we bring volunteers in. So you can also sign up to be a volunteer on our website. On it, it does depend on how COVID continues um, because a lot of the school districts right now aren't sure what they're doing, so we're not quite sure how we're going to incorporate volunteers in yet. But uh, we'll post it on our website and on our social media. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take my phone and I'll. I want to pan um, our kind of see what goes into the schools. It's a very very awesome educational tool. And this right here, this is a custom made chiller unit. So this is how we keep the water the same temperature as the ocean. And then we have, and then the canisters is our filtration system. That is one of our, one of our ticks. So I'm gonna switch back to my view here. Awesome, is there any last questions? that you guys would like me to answer? I think that is all of the questions that um, came through the chat or the Q&A box. We are kind of asking them along the way. So yeah, you're getting lots of kudos in the chat though. So I hope that you yeah. can uh, feel the appreciation from everyone. Uh, it was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. It was uh, really cool and I learned a lot and I am a new fan of barnacles so that's an exciting thing to have. Um, uh, just a reminder to everyone here we do have one more presentation as part of our bio blitz so tomorrow at 1 30 p.m. we're going to be joined by Amy Rowley and the BC Cetacean Sightings Network to discuss marine mammals and whales. Oh and of course, we have three more days until Sunday evening to continue making observations on iNaturalist. So Yuko has it open on the screen right now. That's the app that you can use to participate in the BioBlitz and submit all of your observations. So um, there's still lots of time to go outside and hopefully try to find like a barnacle or a sea cucumber or any one of these animals or other surprises that Yuko discussed. 
Yeah, I was so nervous about this. So I like, Yogi, you got to do it with me for extra information. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I hope everyone checks out Secretaria's social media, our YouTube channel. Uh, give us a subscribe and a like. We'll, we'll be pushing out some new content soon. So excited for everyone to check us out. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thanks so much, Yuko. So. Bye, everyone.